Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. I went fishing with a friend in his boat, which was an 18-foot aluminum fishing boat, to Lake Kincaid in southwestern Illinois. We trolled around the banks of the lake all morning and all day fishing for smallmouth bass till just before dark. Then my friend says, let's cruise around a while at speed. We cruised around for a while, then to a large cove across from the dam and stopped approximately 50 meters from shore. Then we both witnessed something on a rocky, brushy cliff where the brush was so thick people didn't walk, shaking the trees very violently, making grunting sounds about at least 60 meters away. But we could not see what was shaking the trees. I was thinking to myself it would have to be a huge buck with antlers just crashing the trees. But then, from that place, a huge rock was thrown at us and landed 15 feet from the boat with a giant splash. From the size of the splash, this rock was at least 5 to 10 pounds. My friend said, what the heck was that? We both knew this rock was thrown many times further than any Olympic shot putter could have thrown. And no human could have thrown a rock that size that far. Then... More shaking of the trees and another huge rock was thrown at us coming very close to the boat. My friend said, let's get the heck out of here and started the motor and we took off. My friend has since passed away. I think a beast capable of hurling gigantic rocks that far could only be a Momo or Bigfoot. I'm sure they live around there and could be encountered again in the area. I later saw a news report in St. Louis Channel 2 titled Pertsborn People, where reporter John Pertsborn traveled to Murfreesboro on the trail of Momo sightings. He interviewed local people in the Murfreesboro area who had seen and encountered. I think he said 25 reported sightings in the last nine years, but that is what made it dawn on me what the possible explanation was for Jim and my encounter. On to the next one. On Happy Hollow Road, south of Gorham in Jackson County in Illinois, I was out mushroom hunting and had my small son with me. I was standing on a small hillside. He was standing on the other side of the creek behind a tree, which I didn't know at the time. I had my back to it. My face was facing the road. I had found some mushrooms. I was bending over, picking them, and I seen a flash of movement behind me, which to me kind of looked like a grapevine, because I wasn't focusing on the actual creature. And it looked just like a grapevine had moved briefly up the side of the tree. Then I saw a bigger part of it step out from the tree. I saw its knee and its shoulder, and went on up and saw its face which was hairy from top to bottom. I didn't see anything that would resemble a flesh tone. It was black. I saw its eyes blink. It had white around its eyes. I could see that part. I guess there might have been lighter and darker colors on its face, but it was all hairy. When I raised up and turned around to look, it stepped behind the tree, where I couldn't see it any longer. I grabbed my son and ran to the car as fast as I could and went home and got the shotgun and went back down there. I found some footprints where it had stood on the side of the creek and that was maybe 30 yards from me. This was the scariest thing, the most ominous thing. I didn't feel like it was going to come and attack me. It was probably as freaked out as I was. We went our separate ways immediately. It was 2 p.m., clear and warm. On to the next one. In Carlinville, in Macoupin County in Illinois, 
At the age of 17, myself and my high school sweetheart were parked just off a seldom-traveled country road in Macoupin County, about 10 to 13 miles south of Carlinville and roughly 10 miles west of Gillsby. We were making out on a farm field access in the back seat of my car, parked about 20 feet off the road. The area was fertile bottomland, just about 50 feet from a bridge over a small creek. There were dense woods around with a small cornfield of maybe four acres cut out of the fertile soil alongside of the creek. The night was one I'll never forget. In our young passion, a foul stench came over the area. But the real thrill soon followed. We heard the loudest, most shrill scream we could imagine. It was very, very close and extremely loud. It started as several low-tone grunts and exploded into the most frightening shrill screams I'd ever heard. It seemed to vibrate the old car we were in. We were both panic-stricken and scared out of our minds. I jumped into the front seat, butt naked, and drove like heck until we were on high ground and away from the woods. I hadn't taken the time to dress until we were miles away from that spot. We discussed what had happened and decided to keep the whole thing a secret. Actually, we looked at each other and said something like, This didn't happen, did it? The whole thing gave me a fear of the woods that lasted for almost 20 years. But as I looked back on it, I realized whatever it was had been watching us, and at any time, if it were a savage beast, had every chance to do whatever it wanted to us. Did we go back later and look for tracks? Heck no. No how, no way. I avoided that area at all costs, day or night. Did the sound resemble online Bigfoot recordings? Well, actually it did indeed, but amplified a hundredfold. I recall as a small child the screams of what the local Illinois farmers call a mountain lion. We had several cattle maimed, and that scream was nothing like the ones we heard that evening. It was just so chilling. There was a lack of nature sounds, birds, and etc., it was a clear late spring evening in Creek Bottom, surrounded by woods and a small cornfield. On to the next one. Near Granite City in Madison County in Illinois. I lived on Old Rock Road in Granite City, Illinois. One evening, we were having a family get-together and we saw a Bigfoot. My brother and several cousins all saw it. It was standing at the railroad tracks in our backyard. It was huge. It was dark and tall. Five children were playing near an old barn at the rear of the family's property. All of the children's attention was brought to something walking along the railroad tracks. As soon as they looked at the animal, it stopped and turned around and looked at them. The children became frightened and ran back to the house. The animal was estimated at seven and a half feet tall. The animal was very muscular with broad shoulders. The hair was very dark with gray mixed in. The children were approximately 60 yards from where the animal was standing. The children were unable to see any facial features. Over the years, the area has been changed by urban development. On to the next one. As my friend and I were walking from his house along his quarter of a mile driveway that meandered through the woods alongside of the creek, we had heard some odd noises that caught our attention. At this point, we had been running through the woods for a few years together, felt extremely comfortable in them, and knew many sounds and signs. Neither of us could identify these sounds. I do not recall the sounds exactly, but it seemed to be some tapping noise somewhat subtle and not alarming, yet it seemed clearly something out of the ordinary. So we decided to hop the old overgrown fence which paralleled the driveway, penetrate the overgrowth, and go into the woods to investigate. Heading in the direction from which the sounds had been coming, we soon noticed that some of the patches of the grass 
that had managed to grow under the canopy of trees was matted down. The matting looked quite fresh as all the blades were still quite green and showing no signs of atrophy or recovery. While clearly other patches of grass nearby were exactly as one would expect, not matted down. We then spread out a little bit as we normally did when investigating the wood. Shortly after this, I spotted a footprint, classic human shape with five toes, in some dried mud. Clear as the day, there it was. Unlike the fresh appearance of the matted grass, this had been here a while as the mud which had originally received the print was now thoroughly dry. I called my friend over while I looked at it thinking, this doesn't make any sense. Who else would be back here and why would they be barefoot? We again spread out and now I was head down and focused on finding more footprints. Shortly thereafter, I heard a crash in the trees and my friend yelled, run for your life. And maybe it was this comment that etched the memory of that day firmly into the memory banks. I could tell in my close friend's voice that he was dead serious. I lit out of there, running through the underbrush, past trees, and hopped the fence at a faster pace before or probably since. Reaching the relative safety of the clearing, the driveway offered, and turned and yelled encouragements for my friend to get out of there. I could see him now, emerging from the underbrush. The expression on his face said this was no joke. Just as I saw him begin to emerge, and before he hopped the fence, a large crash of breaking timber happened from directly behind him. Although the overgrowth was relatively dense, I could see he wasn't causing the sounds of the smashing logs. Something had apparently broken a good-sized tree or log directly behind him. There was no mistaking the sound of it, or the movement in the undergrowth behind him, and to his right. But what it was remained shrouded by the forest growth. He made it across the fence, and upon reaching where I was, apprehensively standing, snapped back around, and we stood shoulder to shoulder, peering into the forest both uncertain of what exactly had happened. I do know these to be certain. Unidentified sounds were coming from the woods. The grass had the appearance of being freshly matted. There was what looked to be a human footprint, completely intact, and showed the entire outline of the foot with five toes. It seemed only 10 to 12 inches long. Something or somebody was smashing up some decent-sized logs, and it wasn't us. Somebody who doesn't scare easily was sure spooked that day. An Illinois state trooper came out that day to investigate our story. The trooper seemed to lose interest when my friend said that whatever he saw was about seven feet tall. On to the next one. In 1963, I was coming of age for the NAM draft and in my mind, there was no question that I would be drafted. It would be only a matter of time, so I decided to dodge the draft and head for the West Coast. Many people in my family were saddened by my decision, but I would not be swayed. The bottom line was that this fight was not about battling someone who desires of world domination, Rather, it was a spitting match and a money maker for those who didn't have the guts to fight themselves. As I left, I thought that I could get lost in a crowd as well as anyone else, and the West Coast was as far away as I could get without leaving the country entirely, so I was willing to take a shot. It wasn't long after I first hit the coast that I found myself hanging with the street hippies and flower children. These people were wandering aimlessly through life, and for the most part, they were doped out of their minds, both day and night, being the rebellious anti-war crowd which dominated California at the time. Soon after I arrived, I found myself hooking up with a guy named Jimmy Brines. Like me, he was on the run, having a dive room in a flop house, and his philosophy was, work cheap and work for cash. This way, people will be happy to have you that they wouldn't dare fink you out. The second part of his philosophy was to keep moving. And so we did. We were now a team. 
thumbing rides was much too risky. So we had adopted the practice of jumping rail cars from location to location, and I had officially become a hobo. It was an extremely dangerous racket. Sometimes we would check the doors on freight cars at night, hoping to find one that we could sneak into, while at other times we would cling between two cars for hours at a time as the train ran down the tracks. Occasionally, we would even make our way to the roof and hold on for dear life. God help you if you had to go to the bathroom or got sick. In those days, the tracks were littered with many of those who fell to their death under the cars doing exactly what we were doing. There was always the threat of being seen and having the cops flag the train down, but we were willing to take the risk. We soon found out that there was a network of camps running up and down the state. Thousands of guys like us created these godforsaken ghettos out in the woods out of trash, scrap wood, and sheet metal. It was hell, and I was starting to wonder if I should give it up altogether. In the second camp we hit, one of the drunks told us, make sure that we sleep close together. We looked at each other for a moment, and I know that we both thought the same thing. When I questioned him about his motivation, he told me that guys disappear from this place at night, especially when the farming season was over. This dude staggered off, and the two of us realized that you could lose your life in these woods for a $5 bill and no one would ever know the difference. We stayed awake that entire night. The next day, I caught up with the same cat from the night before, and this time, he was relatively sober. So, I asked him about the guys disappearing. He looked me square in the eyes and said that the hairy men took bums like us for food. I shook my head in disbelief and asked him what the heck a hairy man was. And he told me there were things in these woods that man knows nothing about. When the food runs out in the fields, they come to us looking for a meal. This was the craziest thing that I had ever heard. Hairy men eating humans. All I could think was that this guy had to be touched in the brain. That afternoon, we split yet again. There was no way we were going to hang here for another night. We slept in the woods by a freight yard for two days, hoping to find an open car, and finally we did. Being a hobo was a lot like being an addict. If people dug you, they would take you in and hook you up with what you needed to know. You became part of the in crowd. Can you dig it, man? So, on our next jump off, we found another camp and got hooked into a little work as well. We worked at a masonry yard for several weeks, crashing inside of some cesspool rings at night. The owner knew it, but he didn't care. We were giving him a good day's work on the cheap, and he knew that we were runners. He had a portable toilet in the yard and let us use the sink during the day. In keeping with our philosophy of always moving on, We split this scene after about 12 days and went back to the camp. When we got back, a number of the guys said to watch our butts because one of the guys was taken in his sleep the week before. When we asked what he had been taken by, they told us that one of the big hairy suckers had gotten him, pulled him right out of his box, screaming and kicking into the woods. All of his stuff was still in the camp and no hobo would ever leave his stuff anywhere. That was the end for me. I hung in the camp for a few more hours while a couple of these guys talked about a boneyard they had found a few miles north that had human remains scattered everywhere. An hour later, I was on the highway thumbing a ride and I didn't care if I got caught or even arrested. I was done with this whole scene, man. It took me almost two months to get home, stopping to work for some food and lodging along the way. When I got home, my draft number hadn't even come up. However, it did, not too long after, at which point I had a change of heart and went into service. Thankfully, I had a good working knowledge of engines, which parlayed me into a stateside gig. And I'm obviously alive and here today to tell my tale. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, 
and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!